thank you all very much for having me here today. Um, uh, a little bit different topic, I suppose, than we've uh, started with so far, but I'd like to talk to you today about continuous flow VAD support in the Fontan uh, patient. Objectives today, I'd like to talk about uh, a little bit of the anatomy lesson of what the Fontan looks like, issues we see with the Fontan circulation, and then what we kind of describe as Fontan failure. Uh, we'll go over some uh, experience from Dell Children's, and then also talk about what's coming down the pipe. Excuse me. Uh, starting off, kind of how we get to the Fontan circulation, we'll use hypoplastic left heart syndrome as an example. Uh, and that's where we utilize the uh, Norwood procedure, uh, and then also uh, deliver um, pulmonary blood flow via the uh, Blaylock tussig thomas shunt. And just as a kind of side note, there's a great movie to watch if you like the something the Lord made. It's a great story about the three kind of developers of this uh, process. Uh, uh, Vivian Thomas is kind of my, one of my, uh, you know, uh, kind of heroes, if you will, uh, a guy that uh, self-taught and raised himself up to basically invent the procedure and show Dr. Blaylock how to do it. And as we are in hallowed ground here, uh, Dr. Cooley himself uh, participated in that very first surgery. He's in that picture somewhere. I'm not sure which character, but um, so moving on, sorry, focus, uh, going back to the next phase of the kind of the trio of surgeries. Uh, the Glenn circulation is set up by attaching the SVC to the pulmonary artery, uh, further offloading the ventricle and advancing the patient to the next phase. The next phase, the final palliation of the um, hypoplastic lift heart syndrome surgery uh, pathway is the uh, total cable pulmonary connection or the IBC is uh, eventually connected to the um, pulmonary artery with the Glenn procedure, separating, running in parallel of those surgeries there, the, uh, those circuitries there, providing a fully oxygenated patient. So what was this procedure? So the Fontaine procedure was originally described by Dr. Fontaine in Paris in 1971, later refined and described by Couture in Argentina in 73. Uh, this was a palliation for the functional or an anatomical single ventricle. Some of those examples are hypoplastic left heart syndrome, tricuspid atresia, pulmonary atresia, intact ventricular septum. So the original procedure was really focused on tricuspid atresia, where we uh, described the process as connecting the uh, right atrial appendage to the pulmonary artery. The thought was behind this was the contractile function of the right atrium augment flow uh, through this process. What was discovered over time, and, and I know Dr. Frazier and I have personally done many of the Fontan conversions, if you will, um, right atrial distension, um, thrombus formation in that, and eventually leading to arrhythmias really uh, lended this procedure to many problems. Uh, later on developed was the intracardiac Fontan where the uh, baffle was placed within the uh, common atrium where the IVC was then uh, baffled through to the SVC that was connected to the uh, pulmonary artery. This later became uh, known as the total cable pulmonary connection, which developed later and the one we use most commonly now is the um, extra cardiac Fontan using a, a PTFE graph from the IVC to the pulmonary artery. The big benefit of this, it kind of removed the suture lines in the right atrium and maybe made much more kind of a uh, continual pathway there. So a little bit about Fontan mechanics that kind of caused some of our problems here. If you think about the normal heart ejecting from the LV coming across through the aorta, delivering pressure and flow to the systemic circulation, passing through capillary beds, and then eventually coming to the right atrium at a pressure of you know, two to eight, relatively low, coming through the right ventricle, pressurizing and being val um, going through the valve pathway, you increase your pressure to the pulmonary arteries to that 18-ish you know, uh, pressure. Then therefore providing a, a gradient from the pulmonary artery or cross lungs to once again, a low pressure left atrium and then starting the cycle over again. Here's the problem. With the Fontan circulation, you're creating a situation where you're um, increasing your central venous pressure to that pulmonary artery pressure required once again to create that gradient across your lungs. And this is kind of a, the nidus of all the problems of the Fontan circulation. Required, but um, can cause problems. What are the problems? The, the complications we see in the Fontan circulation uh, the one most noting, mind you, this isn't all Fontans, but is a good um, chunk of these patients. Um, and when we're talking about 
uh, circulatory support to transplant. This is some of the things we definitely see in this population. Uh, protein losing enteropathy, where that lymphatic leak into the gut due to higher than normal venous pressures in, uh, in the environment of a low pressure lymph system pours off that fluid uh, into, into those uh, organ systems. Those proteins being albumin, coagulation factors, immunoglobulins. Uh, edema secondary to oncotic pressure loss. So as you're losing um, your albumin, your uh, oncotic pressure goes down, increases edema, kind of circles back on itself. Coagulopathies due to uh, factor loss, growth delay. Albumin is one of the primary carriers, transport mechanisms for calcium, for bone density. And then of course, immune compromise and then leading to poor healing. So an exacerbation of many problems. Uh, guess what? This happens in the lungs too. So plastic bronchitis. So that once again, that um, spillage of protein rich lymph into the airways causes developing of thick casts in the lumen of the airway. Um, this can lead to severe, I mean, this is blocking of the airways uh, progressively. So severe hypoxia, that word. Um, and then also potentially uh, even leading to death. Um, these can typically or sometimes be removed from bronchoscopy or even patients can cough these up. Now, if you cough that up, I might just be done for it. I don't know if I could pass <laughs> through that. Uh, other problems we see with these patients, once again, due to higher venous pressures, we have Fontan associated liver disease. So lymphatic overflow and congestion of the liver as well. This can lead to esophageal varices, ascites, fibrosis and cirrhosis of the liver. And once again, because of the uh, poor synthesis and disease of the liver, we can have coagulation abnormalities. You can kind of see kind of some recurrent themes of feedback mechanisms that cause some of these problems. So the Fontan failure can kind of be described in two different pathways. The circulatory failure where we have these elevated PVRs, and mind you, all these, or much of these patients uh, end up being on uh, high levels of phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors and the sildenafils, the didalafils, and even bosentin to get those PVR, um, uh, the resistance down through the lungs. Hydrostatic pressures, the pressures within the Fontan circulation are very uh, variable to uh, standing and laying and so on and so forth. Uh, obstructions within the circuit itself, these are not straightforward surgeries. Um, there can be a lot of energy loss, especially in the the extra cardiac or the intracardiac fontan where the atrial wall can be um, very modular and change shapes. Uh, some, sometimes there's a lot of stasis in these, in these circuits. Um, and with this, we have um, potential pro uh, progressive cyanosis and the development of uh, aortopulmonary collaterals. So on the other end of things, not the, you know, the circuitry, the plumbing of the process, the pump itself can become a problem. Many of these patients especially in the hypoplastic left heart syndrome pathway, uh, we're using a systemic RV, a RV to create uh, the higher pressures that an LV would be accustomed to. This is not a long-term strategy and we almost always see some kind of dysfunction in these LVs long-term. Uh, so that develops in the low cardiac output. We can develop cyanosis in this. And of course, uh, with low cardiac output, develop indoor dysfunction that can lead to other problems. So you can see there's kind of feedback mechanisms here that we can't really get around with. The one thing we can do or try to do is fix this problem. And we can do that with mechanical circulatory support. So I'd like to share kind of our, some of our experience at Dell Children's Hospital in Austin and keep our kind of motto in, in check. Um, our, for the last two, four years, we, or excuse me, two years, we've done four patients, all of them single ventricle for our continuous flow devices. So we had an 11-year-old with a heterotaxia and balanced AV canal. We poured a hardware in. 19-year-old, uh, uh, extracardiac fontan with a hardware. 12-year-old with an uh, extracardiac fontan with a heart rate 3. And then now we currently still have on a 13-year-old with an uh, extracardiac fontan um, awaiting transplant. All the previous patients have been <coughs> transplanted successfully. So I want to go over the, our first patient real quick uh, because she was unique. Um, so we had an 11 year old with heterotaxy, unbalanced AV canal. She had her Fontan in 2019. About 10 years after that, she came to us with worsening heart failure. During her stay, she was kind of being evaluated and worked up for transplant, but she had a cardiac arrest. Um, this was a big deal. We had a really hard time getting access. Uh, she had scar in every vessel in her body. So the very prolonged um, uh, CPR event. She did get on successfully 
uh, onto ECMO. Uh, we did take her to CT to kind of check some of the boxes, make sure we're okay. We did see some subacute uh, cerebral infarcts, but nothing that kind of really indicated that, that it was a no-go. We even woke her up on ECMO to make sure we could get some level of neurologic exam. Um, another challenge, we actually implanted this from the right atrium to the aorta. We did this for a few different reasons. One, I just said we had 120 minutes of CPR. So the chest was really beat up. A lot of hemorrhaging in there already. Uh, she'd been on ECMO for seven days. Um, and also the fact that this is, all these patients are three, four, five time redo uh, uh, sternotomies. So the scar level, the adhesion level within this chest was immense and everything was bleeding. So to dig out the ventricle to implant this in a normal fashion was, was really not an option. Um, so that was one problem. Also part of the problem is because of this heterotaxy and the unusual kind of structure and architecture of the um, uh, aortic, or excuse me, AV valve, we really couldn't fit something into a, um, the apex on this relatively small heart. So the choice was to go through the uh, right atrium to the ascending aorta. Uh, we did this kind of in a unique way because we didn't go do it on bypass. We were already on ECMO, so we utilized our bypass pump on standby as kind of a de-airing mechanism. So uh, my colleague, Tiffany Robb, wrote this up nicely last year. So the rest of our patients, we did implant in what the re relatively normal pathway. We did put the pump in the systemic ventricle, but the systemic ventricle was a right ventricle, which is full of heavy trabeculation, kind of a perfect nidus for one, pump occlusion, and also for uh, uh, thrombus within that ventricle. Low heart failure patient, low cardiac output patient, a lot of uh, trabeculae. We had to be very careful to kind of make sure we didn't have any uh, or excuse me, thrombus within there. So the second problem you see in these patients is where you're going to put the uh, aortic anastomosis. This whole uh, ascending aorta has been mutilated. So it's full of suture lines, unusual connections of the, the uh, pulmonary artery and the original aorta making a neo-aorta. Um, foreign materials, whether that be cadaveric tissues or Dacron or whatever. So you have to find a place to fit this graph. So that's a, a challenge as well. So also challenges you see, see, this, see with these patients. Uh, for example, our patients three and four, aortic insufficiency with VADs, unacceptable. You just create a feedback loop within the heart and within the VAD that is unacceptable. Anything other than mild, we have to address. Uh, so you can address that with aortic valve repair, uh, aortic valve replacement, or you can even just close the L uh, aortic valve LVOT. Um, that definitely increases the risk of thrombus formation. The problem with this, once again, like I just said, this aortic root, this ascending aorta is a god awful mess. So we have to think about what that looks like. You have to skeletonize the aortic um, outflow tract to be able to do a aortic repair, which uh, causes another level of uh, hemostatic problems and also um, just the different tissues. So we have to think about that and time on bypass. Um, so what did we do? We employed a park stitch for two of these patients. So that's his central stitch approximating the nodules orantius. I always kind of like saying that word, orantius, it's fun. Um, so what this does is due to this uh, large amount of AI during diastole, it brings those that center portion of the valve together and makes it competent. So the, the, the aortic insufficiency is solved. And it also allows some level of opening of the commissures to wash that valve out and allow some flow in there, reducing the potential thrombus around that uh, outflow. So we employ that in two of our patients. So how do you know where you uh, end up being on RPMs and flow in these patients? So typically, especially described in the adult population, you do a ramp study. So you uh, do this using echocardiography. Uh, you observe uh, the septum position. So moving left or right, depending on the offloading of the LV, um, uh, LV size to understand if you're properly offloading. How often is the aortic valve opening, determining the pressures across that aortic valve and increase RV pressures. If you're not offloading the LV properly, then it backs up into your RV and you're gonna have problems with that. Well, guess what? We only have one ventricle. There's no septum to look at for septal <laughs> position. Uh, very little reference on what size ventricles are gonna be proper. And you very well may have a park stitch in place so you can observe that aortic valve opening properly. So uh, we took these kids to the cath lab. So uh, wanting to make sure that we had therapeutic anticoagulation in place and anti, uh, 
or platelet inhibition properly. We want to make sure there's no uh, thrombus within the root LDOT that we're going to mobilize. Uh, stabilization between these changes, we have to make sure and um, kind of sit on our hands a little bit and let them let things stabilize. With the very kind of compliance of the venous system, uh, these changes take a little while to kind of get to where they're going to end up being. So we started uh, by lowering the RPMs of the devices until the AV valve opens or every, um, every beat or uh, looking at the AV valve regurg as it increases. So we looked at all these values and uh, documented them and um, uh, trended them throughout the process, looking at uh, uh, the VAD settings, uh, pulse index, so on and so forth, looking at uh, pressures along the Fontan circuit, and also looking at saturations, and then actually looking at those structures and seeing how they react to these changes. Kind of disappointing results to be very straightforward and honest. So this is our hardware patient. We weren't able to, because kind of extenuating circumstances with our first patient, weren't able to do uh, a ramp study. Second hardware patient, we ramped them all the way from 2,400 to 2,900. Um, I don't know if you noticed though, pretty flat lines. We really didn't see any ex um, uh, exciting changes with, that we could dial this into. Um, the similar things with our HeartMate 3 patients, you can see the CVP or the Fontan pressure stayed pretty much flat. The capillary wedge pressure, your left atrial pressure stayed pretty flat. And we didn't get a huge bump out of any saturations as well. So our, our fourth patient, very similar process. So one thing we kind of had to go by was that AV valve regurg, since also we couldn't really look at the aortic valve. So we looked at the aortic valve, AV valve regurg and then dialed back just appropriate to keep that in, in check. So sometimes we have to always think about kind of these feedback loops. So we have this relatively fixed PVR in these patients. Um, like I said, they are on uh, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance reduction meds. Um, we can't be too aggressive to overflow the um, pulmonary system and create pulmonary edema. In, by going faster and faster and kind of sucking the, the Fontan dry, if you will, we increase those venous pressures and cause uh, more problems. And I always have to think about what's downstream from all this. So if we have higher venous pressures by uh, increasing the flow of the bad, we, bad, we can't uh, decompress the lymph system as well. If you remember the uh, thoracic duct dumps right into the um, innominate vein, which if we're pressurizing, that valving system can't work properly and decompress the, the lymph system. So where is the sweet spot of the QPQS with these, with these VADs? I hate to tell you, but I can't tell you. Uh, there's not, perfect place to be. The key points that we found in these patients to get them in that sweet spot, make sure we're offloading the AV valve regurg, ample cardiac output to maintain an end organ function, primarily renal so we can make sure and uh, balance their uh, volume, volume, or volume status, and also gut to make sure we get quality nutrition in there, and also that we're not overflowing the lungs. So the good news is, hopefully there are some things down down in the future that will uh, help us with this. Uh, the group at CHOP has reported successful use of total artificial heart and failing Fontan circulation. Now this is quite the undertaking, those of you who participated in these, um, but that does solve the problem. There's a pump and there are valves on the venous <coughs> side of the circulation now that takes care of this, but this is definitely a uh, one-way pathway to transplant. Um, currently. So in the lab, there's still some work that's very exciting stuff. There's some centrifugal pump systems that kind of uh, decompress the SVC and IVC circulations and, and push into the pulmonary circulations. Um, so far, so good, but uh, they came across a few problems that were nicely defined by the Rotafeld group that has been working on this. I, I remember seeing the first presentation, I think in like 2002. So uh, this group has been working on this uh, long and hard. One thing they really defined in their processes and their research was that you have to have a passive system as well. So if the, the um, pumped mechanism or the artificial portion of this fails for any reason, you still have to have open pathway and passive pathway for your primary <coughs> blood flow. So we're coming down, coming down the road, but um, I'm excited to be here to be talking about this because I know for a fact that there's some of this work going on right here in the Texas Medical Center. Um, so hopefully we can see some advancing of some of this as well. I encourage you to come visit us in Austin sometime. We're uh, growing in a fantastic program. And I'd like to give a big thank you to Texas Heart. And this is exciting that we're at a 60th anniversary of Texas Heart Institute and 50th anniversary of 
uh, THI perfusion. <clears throat> what I learned here and what I was exposed to here, and I see a lot of really familiar faces that learned me, um, brought me to where I am today. So thank you all very much. <laughs>